All right, today we'll be covering The Dutch Republic. It's a story, another story from the 16th and 17th century of a quick rise and fall of an empire. So what makes them unique? There's a lot of things about the Dutch Republic that are unique. One thing you got to know is they are basically, at this time period, they're the exception to everything. Okay? Some things to preview the lecture, religious toleration. They actually allow for religious freedom. It becomes a safe haven for Jews. Um, economic advancement on a level not seen in Europe yet. Political ideas. They're a, technically in name, they're a republic. So they elect officials. At this time when everybody else is essentially governed by a king who's not elected, right? An absolute monarch. They are a government with elected officials. So they are the exception to everything during the 17th century. Let's talk a little bit about how they came to be. So first, if you're going to be a government or a, a nation that chooses its course, you have to get the oppressor, you have to get those who control you out of the way. In this case, that was Spain. So they revolted for the better part of 80 years. It was a long time towards independence. And this is the series of the war. Eventually, by the end, 1589 to 1598, the last revolt called the Dutch Revolt, results in the seven northern provinces, which become known as the, the independent Dutch provinces. And then we get the southern part, which is still controlled by Spain. So there's 17 original provinces, seven gain their independence and become the Dutch Netherlands as we know it. And then below the green part here, that's the Spanish Netherlands, so still controlled by Spain. So basically, some provinces gained independence, some didn't, and they're still under the authority of Spain. Note, another term for the Netherlands, there's lots of terms for the Netherlands, which gets confusing, but they're also called the Dutch. So the Netherlands, the Dutch, we'll talk about Holland. So one of the results, after war with Spain ends, the seven Dutch provinces are officially recognized by the Treaty of Westphalia. So they're given political status in the world, which matters. Because if you're recognized formally as a nation, right? Well, the world says, all right, you've arrived. Like the United States. They were officially recognized as a nation after they gained independence from Great Britain, right? And that gives you world status. You're no longer just a, a small country fighting for independence. You are a nation as recognized by the world. So after independence, we enter this period called the Golden Age of the Dutch Republic. Now, gold, right? Good or bad? Good or bad. Well, bad in this case. <laughs> okay, good and bad, good and bad. But overall, when we use it in history, when we refer to a golden age of an empire or anything, that's a very, very good time. So the Golden Age of the Dutch Republic is considered their high point. Some reasons. Vast wealth, growth, political and economic vitality, meaning political and economic thriving. They're the world leaders in trade, so in terms of shipping industry, merchants, they take over, and we'll see why. And then they also uh, have a lot of famous contributions to art during this time. Rembrandt and other Baroque artists that we'll look at, and that we'll also get to see at the Getty. Uh, they come from the, the period of Dutch Baroque art, which we're gonna talk about transitions into Dutch realism. Some modern references. You may have seen The Fault in Our Stars. Who's read it? Okay, it's a fantastic book. It's my favorite John Green book. And <laughs> actually, I don't know if it's my favorite. It's the only one I've read. Uh, but I really liked it. Um, the, the, they have a very good soccer team. Holland or the, the Netherlands, their soccer team. They lost the World Cup in 2012 to Germany. No, 2008. Yeah, yeah, I was traveling around. It was awesome. I was traveling around Peru, and I got to watch Germany play the Netherlands in Peru, which if you get a chance to watch soccer for the World Cup, if you get a chance to watch soccer in nations outside of the United States, I'll just say, my hypothesis, it's better. <laughs> because the, the world, that's the world sport, right? Everybody plays soccer. Uh, it's not so much the United States sport, but if you watch it internationally, it's so much fun. Okay, so today the Netherlands, Referred to, as I mentioned, as Dutch or Holland when people talk about those things. They're talking about this nation right here. They're talking about the same thing. Check this out. 
we can pause the video. All right, here's another illustration. So by 1650, this is what Europe looks like. So take a look. This is after the Treaty of Westphalia. And one thing a treaty always does is it clarifies boundaries and borders. Because it comes after a long period of war, right? Where people are fighting for land, territory, boundaries, borders. So a treaty always says, okay, no more war, and let's, let's set some rules up, right? Like, these are the boundaries, this is your empire, and you now need to stay out of here. So, in this case, we see the split, the Holy Roman Empire, and we get Austria, and who's in charge of Austria? Oh, the hot Hitler. Hitler. <laughs> 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 yes, 1940, he will be. But at this time, who's in charge of Austria? The Habsburgs. The Habsburgs, right? Okay, so eventually this is going to disintegrate and the Habsburgs are going to expand their power. And the Ottoman Empire is also going to start to weaken in terms of power and the Austrians are going to expand. And then France, we're going to see how France during this time period also is going to grow. So by the time the end of the 17th century rules around, basically you got three superpowers in Europe. You got England, you got France, and you got the Austrian Habsburgs. And then we'll we'll talk more about Russia. They come up later in European history. They always just got get kind of mentioned. Just know this: Russia's always behind. They're always behind. So they lag behind in everything. Industrial Revolution. When it comes to World War II, they're not ready for it. All sorts of things. All right, politics. So they're a republic. Like I mentioned, they're the exception to everything. They have elected officials while the rest of Europe's moving toward a system of absolute monarchy where the king has absolute control and says, God gave me this power and everybody must submit to my rule. Right? So they're moving away to, right from that towards constitutional monarchy, a system where it says, this is our constitution and we will live based on this document. And because of that, we will elect officials and we'll have a democratic form of government. So the central government is called the States General, centered in Holland, the most powerful provinces. So each province, each of the seven provinces, elects these things called stadtholders, and those are like their senators. Um, but at the end of the day, who had the most power? It was Holland, William of Orange, and the House of Orange, which you read about in the homework. So, at the end of the day, if it comes down to war, the House of Orange can say, we're going to war, we're not going to war. So it's not a true republic in every sense, but it is a republic in form. So I talked about that a little bit. You read about it in your homework. So, stadtholders are the elected representatives. <laughs> the house, the power is divided, just like the United States in terms of houses. But unlike the United States, like I said, except in the event of war. So William is the king? William's the king. Okay. William's the king. And William's a figure who's going to show up multiple times in the next couple chapters. When we get to the glorious revolution in England, they invite William, because they're not happy with their king, they invite William, who has now married an English woman of royalty, they invite William to come into England and take over. So he becomes, at one point, the king of the Netherlands and the king of England. But we'll get to that. A lot of people said, yeah, we're a republic, but that's not true at all. Truthfully, it's kind of like Pericles in Athens. It's a republic in name, but he has all the power because he's so influential. So a lot of people criticized the government and said, cool, yeah, we're a republic. Not. We're actually more like a monarchy, and William makes all the decisions along with the House of Orange. So you can make an argument, a strong argument, that it wasn't necessarily a republic. They just were fronting as a republic. All right, religion. So religion in the Netherlands, they're a mainly Calvinist nation. They'd become that during the late Reformation, which was one of the reasons that they were fighting in the Thirty Years' War against the Catholics. Um, Mostly, most Calvinists, we've talked about this, they rejected symbols. We were talking about this the other day. They thought symbols of the Virgin Mary, they thought symbols of the church were part of the problem. They called it idolatry. So as a result, 
they would crush in certain places. They would have these revolts and people would go out and they'd crush all these Catholic symbols called iconoclasm. We went over that. So they destroy public images saying that they're not Christian values. Questions about that? Questions about that? Yes. This? Okay, so this is after independence, right? So after you achieve independence, 1609, you have to decide what, what's the future of our nation, right? You now have the power to decide. Much like the founding fathers got together at the Constitutional Convention and said, what are we going to be, right? So after 1609, they become a republic. All right, more on religion. So this is the landscape of the religious division of Europe. You can see that Catholicism still has a very strong hold in Europe with some Calvinist specs throughout. Very strong Calvinist ideas centered in Switzerland. Why would that be? City of, City of Saints, founded by who? Um, Calvin. John Calvin, Calvin, right? So Switzerland is where Calvinism began. Obviously, its, its roots are going to be strongest. And then you look at way up here in the Netherlands, what we're studying, that's the largest purple block as well, right? So Calvinism was very strong in Switzerland and also in the Netherlands. All right, religion in the Netherlands, after independence. I mentioned this. This is one of the most important ideas about the Netherlands. Well, other countries, such as France at this time, are being forced into one state religion. The Netherlands promoted religious tolerance. Mainly Calvinists, but Catholics lived mostly peaceable after the Eighty Years' War. So after the wars with the Catholics, they were given, uh, they were tolerated in a different way than other nations. And also, this was very unique. It became a safe haven for Jews during this time during the 1700s, especially. And this leads to many refugees. So they're being persecuted in other nations. And Jews find a safe haven in the Netherlands, and they also find a place where their education pays off and they can take advantage of business opportunities. So the Jewish community becomes very influential in the economy as well. Which is a reason that, we'll talk about this more later, the Jews are oftentimes persecuted throughout history. Because times are good, they move in, Things go well, but then because they're a minority group, when things turn bad, what do people say? It's their fault. It's their fault. They didn't earn what they got. They cheated their way to the top. All of these things, and they become a scapegoat throughout <laughs> too much of history. That's why the Netherlands is, um, was it against Jews or like for them? Did they just let it? At this time or at later times? Uh, the, their, their track record, yeah, I don't know their track record really, like, during the time of the Holocaust. I know that certain nations like Denmark, for example, basically promoted as a whole nation the protection of Jews. So, uh, I'm not sure about the Netherlands, though. Good question. All right, economy. Growth in farming, growth in cities, new forms of agriculture, some new technologies. Most important thing, they become the world's shipbuilders. So they put out 10,000 ships during this time period, and they sell them to other nations, and they use them themselves. Fishing industry thrives, and they become the leaders, and they take over the spice trade. So economy is booming. And then this thriving art market develops to capture this idea. So freedoms in the market allow the economy to grow, and then freedoms in art allow people to express themselves. So here's a chart in terms of Amsterdam becomes the most important city, their capital, and they're trading all over the Indian Ocean, all over this kind of the spice region. So they become the world leaders in the spice trade. So the Dutch East India Company, if you don't have this, make sure you get this in your notes. This is very important. So they develop what becomes 